In this video, we're going to look at solving 2D steady conduction problems with spreadsheets. First, we'll define a problem. We'll come up with a finite volume formulation. Then we'll carry out a spreadsheet calculation. And we'll look at the same problem solved with a computer code calculation. So the problem I'm going to look at is a simple two-dimensional conduction problem. We're going to take one for which an analytic solution does exist. And you can feel free to look up that analytic solution and play with it and compare it with your results. The problem is we have a solid, which is rectangular. In this case, the height and the length are of different dimensions. It has a constant conductivity. Of course, it's two-dimensional, and it will not be varying with time. It'll be steady. And we know the temperature at all boundaries. And in fact, the temperature up here on the north side is temperature 1, and all the other three boundaries are specified to be the same temperature, T2. Well, we're going to solve that by breaking it up into control volumes. We use a finite volume method. So we'll break it up into volumes like this, where in the interior we have a whole bunch of control volumes that are in principle the same, and then we have a bunch of boundary uh, control volumes where we're going to specify the temperatures along those boundaries. And so the other assumption is that for this using the spreadsheet, we need to know the temperature at all the boundaries. Let's look at any one of these general control volumes. We'll blow it up here and we'll it'll give us the general equation for solving all of those control volumes. So now we have an x and a y direction, and we'll increment our temperatures in the x direction by incrementing i. So our central volume, the one we're trying to solve for, is Tij. And if we move towards the east, we'll get Ti plus 1, comma j. To the west, we'll get Ti minus 1. And if we move to the north, we'll get Ti, i is fixed moving in this direction, but it's j plus 1. And similarly, if we go towards the south, we have Ti at j minus 1. And we're going to make the constraint that our control volumes are square. So that is, the dimension in this direction is delta x, and that's the same dimension in this direction, delta x. It's a fairly restrictive constraint, but we're going to make it so that we can use the spreadsheet. So I put our compass points here just to remind us. And of course, our governing equation is that E in minus E out plus E gen is equal to E stored. Well, we've already assumed that there's no energy storage, so that's equal to zero. In addition, and then we're now going to assume that there is no generation, so that term will be equal to zero. And we're left with what energy goes into our control volume will go out of our control volume. So I can draw these. Now I'll label the fluxes, or so the heat rates, on each of the four faces of my control volume with their compass point. So I'll call this one Q West, and the way I've drawn it, it's going in, so I've colored it blue. I'll call this one Q South, QS, and it's coming in, and I've defined it going in, so I'll color it blue as well. On the opposite faces, Q East and Q North, I have defined them going out, which I'll use in the formulation, and therefore I've colored them red. So we have EN minus E out is equal to zero. Let's approximate each of these terms course, the two ins are the west and the south, and the outs are the east and the north. Now let's start approximating each of these terms. Q west over here, using Fourier's law, where we approximate the temperature gradient as the first order difference Tij minus Ti minus 1 comma j divided by the spacing between them delta x. So Fourier's law tells us this minus the conductivity times the area, which is delta x, and we'll assume it's a dimension 1 into the screen. So the area is delta x, and we have Tij minus Ti minus 1 comma j divided by delta x, the distance between these two points. So obviously those delta x's will cancel out, but we'll leave them there for the moment. Looking now at Q east, very similar expression, the area is the same, and we now have our temperature gradient approximated by Ti plus 1 comma j minus Tij over the distance between them delta x. Looking now at the south face, the same thing, except our, our gradient is approximated by Tij minus Tij minus 1 over delta x. And finally, going out on the north face, Tij plus 1 minus Tij over delta x, same area, same conductivity. Putting that all together, every single term had a delta x in the area and a delta x in the temperature gradient, which cancels out from each and every term. So I can cancel those out, collect my terms, and I get this expression here. And notice that there's a conductivity multi multiplying each and every term, such that I can cancel out the conductivity or divide 0 by the conductivity and see that I have minus 4 Tij is equal to minus the sum of all the four neighboring temperatures. 
or dividing by the minus 4, the temperature that we're looking for, Tij, is equal to the average of these four temperatures that we use to approximate the temperature gradients there. Well, that makes it very, very easy to solve. Remember our problem. We know the temperatures on each of these faces. And so I can look at any one of these and say it's simply the average of all of these four surrounding it. This one, the average of the four surrounding it. So as long as you know how to go into your spreadsheet and set it to allow circular references, all you have to do is put an equation in each one of these cells where the temperature is equal to the average of the four surrounding temperatures. Excel will complain unless you find the option, but once you set to allow circular references, or whatever they're calling it these days, it'll work just fine. So let's look at a specific problem. We'll take the H to be 1.3 meters, the L to be 0.7 meters, and we'll set T1 to be 50 degrees while T2 is equal to 100 degrees. So we can go into our spreadsheet, set those top temperatures to be 50, and we've implicitly chosen a delta X when we do that by by the number of cells that we've chosen there. We have to be very careful that we pick the right number of delta y, the, the right number of cells going down the height, so that the, the delta y is the same as the delta x. That was an important assumption in the derivation of this. And we set the known temperatures here, 50 there, 100 here, 100 here, and 100 here. And we just tell each one of these equations of these cells in here to be the average of its four neighbors which you can see solved here. Those are the temperature distributions. Now you can go in and make a rather ugly plot. Uh, some people maybe know how to make nice Excel charts. I never know how. You can see this is flipped over. The 50 degrees is on the side. Uh, and for some reason, it's binning these into really coarse bins and putting series numbers. Uh, you can see I don't use Excel much. But you get the sense that from the low temperature, we have temperature contours going out this way and it's a constant temperature of 100 all around these faces, etc. Now, this is done for a fixed um, delta, delta x. Before we change that, let's calculate the heat flux through each of these faces. It's not hard to do. Here's the original spreadsheet that I just showed you, where I had all of these temperatures here. And now I can calculate, for example, dt dy here by estimating this temperature minus this temperature over my delta. That will give me the temperature gradient there. I can multiply it by my conductivity to get the heat flux, and I can multiply it by the area, or that delta x times one into the screen, in order to get the heat rate. And that's the heat rate coming out this one little part here. I can copy those equations across this whole extent here, and when I add them all up, I get an estimate of the total heat rate going out of that top surface. It's positive, it's in the positive direction, and therefore it's going out of that top surface, which is what you expect with the walls at 100 and this wall at 50, the heat flux is going to go out that top surface. I can do that on all the faces, approximating my temperature gradient here, T2 minus T1 over the delta X, multiplying by the conductivity, multiplying by the area, and summing it all up to get the total heat rate that's coming in across this face. A positive number is coming in across here. Same thing on the east face and the south face, and I'm checking here to make sure that my dx is, in fact, if it is, 0.1 for each of these that will add up to the 0.7 width that I want and the same dy being 0.1 will add up to the 1.3 height that I want here. I can check my energy balance to make sure that it's okay. We'll see soon that there's actually a really big problem with this but because we've applied conservation of energy in each and every volume and we've calculated the gradient exactly the same way as we've calculated it in in doing our control volume formulation of course, energy should be conserved across there, and in fact, it is. Sorry, it's bigger over here if you want to look at it there. And we're seeing that there's about 50,000 uh, watts going into this domain. Now, if we want to change the size of this, it's a little bit of a pain. We have to make a new sheet, and we have to add more cells and repeat all of this such that the delta Y is smaller. If I want to have delta Y of a 0.05, obviously I need double the number of these cells here, double the number of these cells here. Not hard to do. Remember this number, it's almost 50,000, 49,800. When I go to a bigger sheet, of course I add those cells, I carry out the exact same process, and now notice that I have now 65,888 coming in, which is balanced by the going out. There's something very funny about this problem, and in fact there's a very good reason for this. Of course, I can do a much better solution if I use my computer code that I wrote for this. So I've calculated the same problem in my Jupyter Notebook, first with a coarse 
volume that's close to the spread seat solution. And we can see a much nicer contour plot. We can see the temperature, in fact, is 100 degrees around these walls. It's the right way around. And I can see these temperature contours as heat is coming in from these surfaces and going out this surface. Of course, I can make that mesh much finer. And it doesn't matter if delta X and delta Y are the same. And now you see this looks much, much nicer here, much smoother contour lines, much better definition. There is a very big problem with this calculation, though. If you look at my calculation, first of all, you can see I have a much smaller uh, delta Y and a different, slightly different delta X, which is much smaller. But if I calculate the heat rates, the heat rate coming in the west value, the west is what I expect. This is negative at the east, and so it's coming in as well. And at the south, it's positive, so it's coming in. And it's all going out the top. Right? Positive, at the, positive at the north value, it's all going out the top. But we have a very big imbalance here. And there's a very significant reason for this. Remember in the Excel sheet, we only looked at these temperatures here, and we specified these ones, and these ones, and these ones, and these ones. We ignored these corners completely. Now what we have here is we have to make a choice when we're calculating this, a choice that we never made in the Excel spreadsheet. We have to make a choice about what's the temperature of this point here. And if the temperature of this point here is the same as this temperature, then we have no temperature gradient in this direction, but we have a very large temperature gradient. We're going from 100 degrees here to 50 degrees here. So we'll get a very large heat flux uh, crossing through here. It can't go out here, and therefore it's going to end up going out here and inflating our heat transfer rate. And so this is a physical problem. This is the same on every corner. And if I made the opposite choice, I would just see it on a different face. I would have the same problem. Uh, but a different face. If I made the opposite assumption that this corner was the same temperature as this one, then I have a very large temperature gradient in this direction where I go from 100 to 50 over one control volume. And I'll have a bunch of heat coming in here which is going out there which is not being accounted for. In addition, as I make more and more control volumes, I'm bringing these two temperatures closer and closer together and making this problem worse and worse. Where does this come from, of course? It's physically impossible to have a point that has 100 degrees on one side and 50 degrees on the other side. And so there's an actual singularity there. It's a rather ill-posed problem, and you would never really have this in reality. It is a case, though, where you'd want to have a very, 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 very fine mesh, and perhaps you might want to remove that singularity, because, of course, you're never going to see it in reality. Perhaps you want to have a small insulated section there, uh, and then you'd be able to at least get consistent results where your energy is very clearly balancing. Having said that, you can certainly get a good first crack using a spreadsheet or a numerical method such as the, the code that I've written in order to see what those temperature profiles look like and how the problem is behaving.